Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board on this historic day. This is actually the first uh, official board meeting of 2021. And um, the first item on the agenda will be the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. And just because it's 2021, I have to start the meeting out by saying I'm on mute. <laughs> So uh, just um, also to agree with you, it's been uh, a while since we've all met, a couple of weeks, and uh, our world is very different today. And I just want to mark today by, um, you know, in so many in so many ways, having Kamala Harris as the first uh, female black and of Asian descent vice president. I know it means a lot to a lot of, of people and um it's pretty exciting for me. So, um, but back to the board business. Uh, we um, have a few meetings coming up that I just wanted to make sure folks were aware of. Uh, today, we're going to hear uh, from our uh, data team and um, our hospital folks on the federal price transparency update. And then tonight, we have a meeting with our primary care advisory group that starts at five. And then um, next Monday, we we continue to have meetings with our prescription drug technical advisory group. I want to thank board member Lunch and Christina McLaughlin for leading those, and of course, all the stakeholders participating in those. And then next week, we're going to hear an update from our data team. So that's going to start in the morning. We have a full day of meetings and starting at 10 a.m. And then in the afternoon, we'll have an all pair model update on some reports, and we'll have the all pair model deferential reports. And that is all I have to report, Mr. Chair. Happy 2021. Did you want to mention a few reports that are now available on the sure, website? I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <sighs> um, so we did submit our annual report to the legislature, per our statute, and that is on our website. And um, there are some also other uh, all pair model reports on our website, and I may be forgetting something that you're referring to, Chair Mullen, but that was the, the big one, the annual report. Okay, thank you, Susan. Next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, December 30th. Who would like to put 2020 behind us? So moved. Second. <laughs> It's been moved and seconded to accept the minutes of Wednesday, December 30th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Motion carries unanimously. And now we're going to move over to the uh, subject of today's meeting. And as Susan said, um, this meeting has been um, somewhat split up because of all the um, um, circumstances of today. Um, we've focused strictly this afternoon on federal price transparency, and we'll have the rest of the data team updates uh, next week. But at this time, I'm going to turn it over to um, Sarah Lindbergh for a discussion on the new rule that went into effect January 1st re regarding uh, price transparency from our hospitals. So, Sarah. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Sarah Lindbergh from the Green Mountain Care Board. I head our data team and I will start by asking if everyone can see the slide that I'm presenting. We can. All right. That's a good start. Um, so I'm here to offer a pretty cursory update on the federal price transparency rule. A lot of information was dropped and so we're still digesting it. Um, and I've been working with both our legal and hospital finance teams um, as we try to do that. So as a review, um, this is a federal uh, requirement for hospitals, according to a CMS rule that said as of January 1st of this year, they would have to post two new uh, resources publicly. One is a machine readable file of um, all the standard charges for their items and services, and then a subset of those services that are dictated by CMS in a consumer-friendly list, um, and they refer to these as shoppable services. 
Um, it will apply to all of Vermont's uh, general hospitals, those for which you do the hospital budget review, but it does not apply to facilities other than hospitals, even if they might perform similar services. Uh, the requirement is limited to those rates negotiated with commercial insurers, so there's nothing that would, uh, you know, prevent a hospital from including it with other information from their public payers, and they could integrate that, but the rule does not require that. Um, as I said, we're actively reviewing the information that will, has been posted by the hospital so far. Um, right off the bat, we noticed a lot of... Is that like a Casio watch from the 80s? That's a great sound. Um, <laughs> Uh, so uh, we it's right off the bat, that it looked like there was a, a great deal of variability, particularly in the way that they approach the shoppable services, and that was um, allowed in the rules. So some people posted spreadsheets or um, comma delimited files. Other people used um, price estimator tools, um, and other hospitals went with the interactive web form approach. So you pick a service, you pick a. a, a type of insurance, you pick a policy number and it will show you the information related to that shoppable service. Um, so here's an example of a price estimator tool um, on the Dartmouth-Hitchcock uh, website. So you look for a keyword or a CPT code, or you can browse by kind of categories of service, and then it prompts you for information about your insurance. And then you would see um, a range of negotiated rates, including the one um, for your particular information you provided. That's an important caveat. Um, and then another example, Rutland has a series of downloadable files. So there's the patient-friendly pricing file, the full scope of their services, and then that machine-readable charge master, which has been um, required for a longer period of time. So uh, a few important notes that this um, rule is consumer focused. So the real audience intended was for consumers to get some information about expected um, expenses for their specific health care services at a hospital. Um, but what it doesn't do is um, in, like talk about the cost sharing or the expected patient share of that expense. This is the full negotiated amount. So that's one thing that limits its usefulness if a consumer is trying to figure out exactly what they would be on the hook for. Um, and given the variety of different formats and, and uh, <laughs> uh organizations and approaches to the information, I think that this highlights how complex uh, this area is and that there's just a lot of variation in billing practice, practices among our hospitals. Um, an important thing for anyone seeking services is that um, the care that you think you're going for might not be what you ultimately get. One classic example is, you know, you think you're going for a colonoscopy to screen and they end up removing five polyps so what you were expecting to spend is going to be a lot different than what the actual um, care that you needed was. And so um, that's just we want to make sure that whatever we do with this information, we're very responsible and um, don't make any false promises because some of this is very difficult to predict ahead of time. Um, and to that end, uh, there may be programs or other need-based services that a patient might be eligible for that if they were to reach out and contact the hospital ahead of time, they may be able to get set up and avoid some of these um, insur insurance-based um, reimbursements. Um, and that might end up being more beneficial to the consumer's pocketbook. And so, um, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of stress in that, that it's always a good idea to contact a hospital proactively to talk about um, what might be on the table before seeking service. And as I already mentioned, you know, these are the full negotiated amounts or allowed amounts and, and is not reflecting the patient's expected share. So without that kind of insurer side of the equation, that's, that's very difficult, if not impossible, for a hospital to necessarily understand ahead of time again. Um, so in thinking through the regulatory applications, um, again, I can't emphasize enough that this is just an incredibly complex um, set of information. So we're still reviewing and assessing the scope of what we're going to want to do. Um, but as I alluded to earlier, there's some things that are going to make apples to apples comparisons challenging. So, um, you know, the, the guidance provided by CMS did allow um, some 
room for interpretation. So that is um, something that we would definitely want to make sure that we were careful in investigating before we tried to use it in any public facing uh, or regulatory uh, context. Um, again, that variability in billing practices um, is something that can be hard to iron out, even if you have, you know, kind of a code level negotiated rate. Um, the limitation to commercial rates. So the reason that's um, important to think about is um, there there can be a relationship between a hospital's um, reimbursements uh, in other public programs and how that flows to their commercial negotiated rates. So uh, I think that it would be a as a regulator, that it would be pretty important to consider the full um, breadth of the patients that a hospital is seeing um, and try to incorporate that. Um, and there's one major area in how the rule uh, directed hospitals to account for non-employed physicians. That might be a real um, a real significant issue to consider if we're going to try to do any comparisons across hospitals, particularly tertiary care hospitals and the way they might handle admitting rights for um, non-employed physicians. So that's just um, some examples of the things that we're thinking through at our first uh, blush. Um, and, you know, I can't say enough that, you know, the, all of this is really based on a fee for service mindset and isn't really looking at it from the value based approach that things like the all pair model are intended to look at where, you know, maybe per service prices is, is less of a consideration. Um, some other things to keep in mind, um, I asked a uh, staff member, uh, Jeffrey, to do a literature search. Thank you very much, Jeff. And, uh, you know, I did this years ago and, you know, I think there's a lot of fear that this might actually increase prices by adding some um, negotiating power um, for maybe hospitals and making that negotiation uh, unbalanced. Uh, we didn't see evidence of that in the literature, um, but there is not a lot of research in this area, particularly for samples of any significant size. So this is going to be a very interesting experiment. Um, but to date, um, you know, we found that very few consumers seem to adopt these tools, um, you know, ranging um, from two and a half to five percent. And um, because the negotiated rate is not closely associated with the consumer's expected share, there really isn't a lot of incentive to use them, um, with the uh, counterexample being those with high deductible health plans where, you know, maybe they do have more skin in the game and are more motivated to do this kind of shopping. Um, we also know that, um, as I alluded to earlier, um, sometimes uh, because of the way your benefits are structured, um, shopping's less of a uh, possibility, um, particularly if there's a you know HMO or some sort of limitation on your network, you might be limited in what you are um, able to access. Um, and yeah, uh, the, but we do think that um, according to the literature that these kind of actual negotiated rights, uh, rates or, or I should say allowed amounts will probably be more likely to spur um, any changes if they're there than the charge master, which we know is not necessarily very closely associated with what the hospitals actually get reimbursed. Um, and just, you know, down the pike, there is a related requirement that was adopted for most health plans and issuers to post machine readable files for their in network, out of network and prescription drug, drug rates, which would apply for plan year 2022 onward. Um, that's still early days. And much like this uh, requirement, I would not be surprised if there were some um, legal action taken in that area. So um, we'll certainly be keeping our eyes out for anything that develops on that front as well. So in the meantime, we will be working on gathering and synthesizing this um, complex data set. And this will be one of the things that in our enhanced data validation work group, we will be considering for its utility in trying to validate um, actual reimbursements that we see in our all claims payer data database of VCures. So um, we're going to kind of try to kick the tires on this with providers directly as part of that process and figure out, um, you know, what information can be this can be used for and how to do that in a responsible way and how that might differ depending on 
if the audience, so um, how we might package it for a consumer, for instance, might be different than say a board member or um, yeah. And, and, you know, I think the main thing is um, just really, it, it's going to, to make sure we understand this fully so that we're, we're, we're using it appropriately. But it, it, I do think it's a, you know, it's a new data point. It's, it's never happened before. So it's hard to predict exactly how it's going to go, but um, we are, going to be following it and keeping you posted so those are the slides i have today any questions i can address thank you sarah that's uh, very very helpful um i'll start out with a couple um i do agree with you that uh, um, i think that uh, for the most part price um, tools have not been effective and it all gets back to um, the fact that um what the patient looks at is what they would be paying. And in that, um, that's therein lies the uh, real problem with healthcare because you never get a true price equilibrium with supply and demand because if someone else is paying the majority of uh, the expense, all you really care about is convenience and quality. And so you end up usually going to your, your hometown um, providers. But I do think that um, we've seen tremendously poor uptake from the actual tools that, for example, Blue Cross Blue Shield has a, a tool for any of their members to um, access. And um, it, it just doesn't result in a lot of uh, healthcare uh, uh, migration. But on the flip side of that, um, on the shoppable um, services line anyways, basically what the federal government did was 75 of the ones that they picked and then the hospital had some leeway on the other 225 plus they had um, the ability to do the calculator instead of the uh, shoppable services. But what I see there is there are a couple of scenarios where it could be quite useful and quite utilized. So for example, you mentioned a high deductible plan if it's, say, for example, the beginning of December and all of a sudden you need to have something done, um, it probably doesn't matter um, anything other than trying to get the, the best price that you can get for that. And I think in that situation, if somebody all of a sudden needed to um, um, have a, a medical procedure done, they would be looking for the lowest price alternative. And the other situation that I... Um, point to is where employers could become major players in this if they created a system where the employee had some benefit. So say, for example, your local hospital um, charges um, $1,000 more than one that's 45 minutes away um, for a procedure. Let's pick something, a colonoscopy. Um, if the employer gave the employee a few hundred dollars as an incentive to go to the lowest cost alternative, um, they would still see a huge savings themselves in their self-insured plans. So I think that there is some usefulness. It's not going to be what everybody um, had hoped for. Um, but do you see those uh, types of utilitarian uses as well? Yeah, I mean, I think those are all totally valid use cases. And yeah, I think, um, yeah, to your point, I think if there's a way we could say, like, even if you're not paying for it at the time of service in, in a deductible or a copay, um, that there's a reason premiums keep increasing. <laughs> so, you know, trying to remind people that even if it, it's a little um, down the line, that they're, they're, that it does have an impact on their, their health insurance. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we've heard a lot through our work with the All Payer Claims Database that providing more meaningful tools for purchasers, such as employers, um, is really an important thing to focus on. And that, that we're, we're happy to help provide any information that might help in that domain. So on the, the larger uh, posting um, that's supposed to be in a machine-readable format of um, all the uh, um, services provided uh, by a hospital. Um, what is the definition of machine readable? And is there an easy way to um, input that uh, uh, data to 
um, from their website to some type of a program that would create a comparison tool. I know that as a board member, one of the more frustrating things is that um, a 4% increase from um, one hospital as compared to a, a 3% increase, it doesn't necessarily mean that that 4% uh, increase makes them, um, you know, um, more expensive than, than the hospital that's only asking for the 3% increase. So is that something that is easily, um, you know, extrapolated from and put into some type of uh, usable format? Um, so I would say that um, machine readable um, had a few. So it just means kind of like it's something you could put into some sort of um, program to read. So and they, they specify a few different formats in which you can do that. Um, however, there wasn't a consistent layout, um, which means that, um, you know, some of these files might have 300 rows or columns across, some maybe have 150, and there's not necessarily consistency. There's certain columns we know need to be there for every hospital, like the, the minimum and maximum, for instance. Um, but uh, aside from that, there's just a lot of variation. And so figuring out a way to clean it up and make it as apples to apples as possible is um, is is not trivial and something that um, we'll be certainly working on and figuring out um, the best way to do that. Uh, and then, of course, because hospitals offer different services, um, you know, it might actually require a little clinical insight in, you know, what, where to, where comparisons are appropriate and, and where they might not be. With just the 14 hospitals, would we be able to um, selectively go to each one and uh, call out the fields and then put it into a, a comparable field on our own database? Yeah, and I haven't um, spent enough time with uh, every hospital's file to answer that today, but that's the type of thing that we're exploring um, to figure and, you know, validating. I think that validation will be an important step. Super. Thank you, Sarah. Questions from the board? I have one. Go ahead, Go ahead. Tom. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just, as this moves forward, it could get pretty complicated because, you know, this is kind of publicly, public data that's in, that's out there broadly in the public on a hospital basis. And it has the CMS uh, label uh, on it, which gives it some high credibility, I think. And I just wonder as for the board, as we go forward, you know, how, um, how uh, how we position ourselves to use the data for our work, but also to maybe be a referee on on how the data can be used or misused. Um, and I think Sarah's presentation clearly uh, um, um, reflects that 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 concern and complexity. That it's a lot of data. I took a and I'm going, to, I'm going to make uh, Sarah nervous here a little bit. So, Sarah, I'll, I will admit from the beginning of this comment, this is not an analysis. But, you know, I took a look at the uh, UVM medical centers and uh, they had it's a big spreadsheet, a um, Excel spreadsheet, and they have 14,237 rows of of uh, of um, procedure codes. And uh, of those 13,290, um, have a Medicaid uh, amount uh, associated with, with that code. Um, and uh, of that, and, and I, I kept in the spreadsheet the minimum and the maximum just to kind of get a, a sense as to what percent of all the codes did Medicaid have the minimum um, uh, allowed amount. And, uh, and obviously those amounts are kind of put on the medical center because uh, Medicaid doesn't really negotiate with, with each hospital indivi individually. But of those codes um, <clears throat> that um, ha had a Medicaid amount associated with them, um, 8,279 or 62% were, were the, the lowest. Uh, and the spreadsheet has a, a minimum and maximum amount. So I don't know if that's good data or bad data. Um, it uh, certainly uh, has a high probability of being misused. and. But I worry as we go through our regulatory processes, 
you know, that um, this brand new source of data uh, that is very complex um, uh, is is uh, is going to be um, uh, a, a source of information that we're going to have to tangle with one way or the other because I think people are going to use it. Um, it's public data and uh, there's dozens of different stories that it can tell. So um, that's something I'm thinking about is just how as an organization we get our arms around this in a fair and thoughtful way using the data for our purposes where we've really scrubbed it hard and we feel that we can rely on it, but also uh, working with our um, stakeholders elsewhere, whether it's the healthcare advocate or um, whoever to make sure that the data uh, doesn't get used in a way that's misleading. So that's not a question, it's just an observation. Thank you, Tom. Other board members. Yeah, I would just echo, I, I went on to, um, you know, a couple of the hospital websites to look at what's out there. And there's a lot of information. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you go in for a, you know, code, I agree with what Sarah was saying at the beginning, you, you, you may think you're going in for one thing, but it could be something different. You know, if you go to a dermatology visit, and then you could look at all the different things they could do and the different costs it would be to remove something by code. I think the average consumer wouldn't really, you know, know how to do that. Um, but I also saw, you know, in some hospitals, they are listing, you know, every single insurer and what they're being reimbursed by that insurer and other hospitals. And maybe, maybe I didn't find the right places, but just just kind of gave a range that said it went from X to Y. So so it's harder to compare, you know, from from that front. Um, but just a comment on, on something that you brought up, Kevin. I mean, I think from a self-insured world, um, yes, there could be incentive to have people, you know, look around for pricing. But, you know, being on the corporate world side, I'd say there's a big but, which is, you know, we're a pretty litigious society. And should something happen, because, you know, even though it, it may have nothing to do with that, they went to a different hospital that costs less. But if something happened, you know, you could you could imagine someone trying to come back at their employer because they recommended going to hospital X versus hospital Y, potentially because of price. So, you know. I agree, you know, it's something, you know, from a self-insured world, you only pay what you what you spend um, and you want it to be less. Um, I think employers tend to stick out of the recommending where people go, um, you know, because of HIPAA and other things. But, you know, that would be interesting to see, you know, how that plays out and, um, you know, if, if, employee, if employers go there. Um, but it would be, you know, it'd be great to be able to benchmark against, you know, the hospitals for some of the procedures. But, you know, the other caution there is without looking at the entire universe, a hospital could be high in one area, low in another area. And I would caution, you know, jumping, you know, that we could jump to a wrong conclusion if we looked across, you know, one code and said, oh, my gosh, this hospital is much more expensive than another without looking at other code, you know, without looking at all of the codes, you know, there, there may certainly be outliers, right? There may be a hospital that's higher on every single one and one that's lower on every single one. But, you know, th those would be things, I think, as we look forward, you know, into this, you know, how, how could we use it? It'll be interesting. But, but um, it's, you know, it's a new thing we'll be looking at starting in 21, for sure. Yeah, and just to um, piggyback on that, um, board member Yusufer is, um, you know, this certainly doesn't incorporate any quality directly in it, um, nor does sometimes the thing that's cheapest on a unit cost basis doesn't end up being the least expensive when you think about readmissions or, or things getting, <laughs> you know, unintended complications. So without the quality or kind of the um, population health perspective, um, it, sometimes it can be short-sighted to kind of do a um, just a procedure level comparison. Any other members of the board? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll hop in just a quick question for you, Sarah. Um, have you, and, and this is probably too soon to tell because I know you're just starting to dig into the data, but I'm curious about, I know the federal government mandated the first 
was it 75 um, shoppable services, but then there was a lot of latitude for the other 225 or so um, hospital choice. And I'm just wondering if, if you've looked at the variation there um, in terms of, is it all across the map or was there sort of some consistency? And this is probably too soon to tell, or have you read about other people who have analyzed this? I'm curious about the 225 that were not mandated. Is there anything information that we're finding yet? Yeah, and I think what what makes it challenging is is that's um, kind of the set that that could be shown to consumers in a, such a variety of ways. So, like, I'm trying to figure out I might have to do like some web scraping to get at the data feeding the web tool, for instance, um, to even get at some of those comparisons. And then I think an important first step is is trying to see if those tools and the information presented in the consumer friendly way are actually jiving with the machine readable you know, entire <laughs> like manifest. Um, and I think that's a really important place to start um, because it's much easier to work with a machine readable file from a data perspective. But if it's not jiving with the consumer facing one, that that's like a really important place to start about why that might not be true, um, which I could think of lots of reasons um, just given some of the latitude. But yeah, so I, I think that that's kind of making it really difficult to get at that really basic question, unfortunately. Yeah. And and I'm just thinking from an entrepreneurial standpoint, this is a treasure trove of data. And I'm just wondering if there's any third parties out there that are, are all over this in creating some kind of, you know, um, you know, yeah, I predict a lot of resales. Of this they're going to do all the web yeah. scraping and they're going to pull this <laughs> yeah. all together and they're going to create tools for lots of states and consumers to use. I mean, I'm thinking there are entities out there that are going to be prepared to, to do this and have all the resources available to them. Is there anything that you've heard of, of some third party that's doing this? I'm not aware of off the, anything off the top of my head, but I, yeah, I fully expect a lot of um, resellers and, and data companies to be doing just that um unfortunately if it's garbage then <laughs> you know well, I don't know like the healthcare cost institute or something like that right so you know so um i was just curious my, my last question was um uh so we've talked about consumers using it potentially although it'll be complicated we thought about how the board might be able to use it caveats and all and i'm wondering is there any been conversation about how insurers are going to use this to do some comparisons of how they're doing in in bargaining with hospitals and, you know, just curious. Yeah, I have not, yeah, I haven't been privy to those conversations. So yeah, that's something else we can certainly monitor. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. And I can't wait to see what you, we all do with this. This is interesting. Although I, I do think to Tom's point earlier, a user's guide or some sort of, um, you know, here are the caveats before the data is misused or misinterpreted, I think is really important. And to the degree that, you know, the Green Mountain Care Board and the, the data team have some insights into that, I think it would be helpful to push that out there so that it isn't misused, because I do worry about that. Okay, are there other questions from the board? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment, and uh, I'm going to call on Eric Schulteis from the Healthcare Advocates Office first, and um, uh, Mort Wasserman, you're on deck. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Um, I just, I mean, so I, you know, echo concerns expressed by the board and by Sarah. Um, I think in response to you know the 70 mandated shoppable services the mandated 70 services that are required um it gets a bit tricky looking across the hospitals just because we have a large number of small hospitals so they are allowed if they don't provide the service to add additional services to get up to the minimum required disclosure of 300 so it's not like every hospital in Vermont is going to disclose those these 70 services because quite a few of them don't provide them all. Um, I just wanted to hit on another topic, this idea that Sarah already hit on of kind of what a big task uh, working with the data is in addition to the different sources and, you know, whether it's a web tool that you have this website that you have to scrape or these machine readable files, it's not in a structure 
that is particularly useful for data analysis. It's pretty clear that under and different hospitals are structuring it different ways. So kind of restructuring the data so it allows for comparisons across hospitals is um, a very is a non-trivial task. And in my opinion, of it's going to take a lot of work to do that. Um, kind of on that end, I think, uh, you know, there, at least in my limited experience with NMC, um, was that they were very interested in working with me and helping me understand, for instance, you know, was a no value for a specific procedure? What did that mean? Was it a zero? Was it mean they're not allowed, they don't provide it for that carrier? Um, so this seems to be a great opportunity to maybe work with Vaz and the individual hospitals and the carriers to kind of attempt to make cross-system comparisons, the whole project of creating a database to do that more tractable. Because I think for any individual entity, it's just going to be too much work. Um, and yeah, and then lastly, I mean, this data is going to be coming out every year. So as we're thinking about how to design this and set this up, I think we should think, we, we're going to need to think a little bit past the immediate term and structure the data so that, you know, when this new data comes out every year, we're still able to implement processes to allow the analysis to be done. And I think it does a, require a little forethought to try to think about what might be done in future years with releases. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, we're going to move to Mort Wasserman and Mike Del Treco is on deck. Mort. Hi, um, I have a question for Sarah and then a comment. What proportion of Vermonters have high deductible plans, the sorts of plans that in theory, price transparency is, they're supposed to help those consumers? Oh boy, you put me on the spot here, Dr. Walsh. Sorry, um, I apologize. <laughs> I'll answer, okay. not I, that many. You know? Yeah, it precisely. It's growing, but it's still not the majority. All right. No, it's nowhere near a majority, if if I understand it correctly. So I was glad, Sarah, that you pointed out that this whole idea of shopping around for services flies in the face of uh, a value-based care all-payer model, as far as I understand it. And it really depends on uh, economic theories, market theories that apply somewhere between poorly and not at all to individual consumers in terms of the way they make decisions about what to do in healthcare. So I would, although this is a lot of data and it's very tempting, it's also in typical fashion, not, uh, it, it's not structured uniformly. There'll be a tremendous amount of work involved to try to uh, allow one to compare it from one hospital to another. So I don't, I, I think if there's a limited amount of time for the data team to be doing stuff in 2021, I'm not sure this is where I would invest resources. Thanks. Thank you, Mort. Mike Del Treco. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me and see me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to uh, thank Sarah and the and the board for their thoughtful comments. Um, and, the, and, and additionally, the public, other public commenters. Um, you know, this is a new data set. You've heard all of the challenges. And um, from the get-go, uh, our, our members have really stressed, call your hospital. And it's not only call your hospital about what code you're going to, or what procedure, or how do I estimate out of pocket. It's also about accessing charity care policies, it's also accessing progr other programs that may be available, um, getting insured if you're not insured. So it's a whole host of things that we want to attach to um, aside from this transparency. So um, if there are any patients listening to this or they, they do listen um, and you use these tools, uh, please reach out, look at, look at your hospital's websites. It's pretty clear who you call and how you get help. So reach out and call. Um, 
and and uh, the to the to Eric and the other patient uh, care advocates on the phone. If there are patients that have issues, challenges that you hear of, I am uh, available to make sure you get the right connection to the uh, CFO or whoever it might be at the hospital uh, that there may be an issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, as Mort has said, that it may be uh, fraught with uh, um, inability of use, but I, I have tasked you and Patrick to take a look at this to see if there are possible constructive uses that uh, make sense for the board. And so we look forward to uh, at least conducting that analysis and not spending too much time, but the right amount of time to determine if there are uses that um, would be helpful and constructive. So uh, thank you for your work today, and I thank you in advance for your work in the future on this. Sure, and we look forward to updating you next week about all the other stuff we're up to, so we can have it a conversation in context. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thanks. Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor of adjourning signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.